Okay, a little audience participation after lunch here. I'd like anyone who didn't make, or who made too much money last year. If you made too much money, please raise your hand. If you, oh, okay. They must work for the resin suppliers. You guys have to leave. <laughs> if you could make more money, would you? Oh, everybody better raise their hand here. Um, welcome to polyethylene. We are an oversupplied, lowest cost, highest price resin in the world. It's not, there's no economic solution to that. So a lot of things have been changing finally in the last, in the last two weeks that's made this a lot more exciting than it has been in the past. Um, one of the things I, I was watching a few weeks ago in HBO, this crummy drug lord movie where they're showing this guy driving down the street and he says, everybody comes to this country for one reason, it's to make money. And then he goes on and he splits up his town with three or four other drug guys and he's making a ton of money. And uh, you know, as, as competition comes in, he still lives his lifestyle and life goes on. He doesn't change at all and he's, his income starts to go down, his customers start to go away. And at the end of the, month, at the, end of the show, he loses his life. So it, that's playing out in the polyethylene world. We've had 24 cents of increases uh, with no decreases, uh, no competition, no changes. So I wanted to put up one slide and talk about that today, but Sam said I had to put up more than one. So I, I created some other ones for some background, give us a little bit of a story of what's been going on in the polyethylene world to help, deter, to help get to where we are today. So we, we watch these market drivers all the time. I think supply and demand is the number one driver of polyethylene. It has been in, in the past two years. There's been limited supply with very good demand, both in North America and globally. Um, the international market, what the, what's happening over there uh, in other parts of the world, and uh, you know, what's the important, where, where's the resin going, and what's the cost of the resin, where it's going. You need to know that and see the activity there. So that's something we pay very close attention to. We're talking to traders out of, uh, out of Texas, out of any, anywhere in the world to see what their activity is. Crude oil used to be at the bottom. I never talked about crude oil. It did, not come, it did not have a big impact on the North American price until the last few years. It has a significant uh, North American pr uh, impact on the North American price. In fact, it may be the number one price driver in the world. Um, secondary market. That's activity that's going on uh, in the broker market. Do they have resin? Where's their price going? Is it going up? Is it going down? Uh, what, what traders are moving re resin through there? It's good to watch that. It's a, probably one of the best indicators of where the market's going, either up or down. Supplier actions, who's raising prices? Who's not raising prices? How strong are they when they sit in your office and when they raise prices? You know, what, how, how, what the phone calls are, is, uh, is it, uh, you know, how many will you take or do you want this one? Two different conversations. Pricing benchmarks, just knowing where the prices are globally. Just have to know where the prices are globally so you can follow trends. Um, operating rates and inventory, um, you know, operating rates of polyethylene are 90 plus percent every month forever, even when plants are down. So I don't understand how 95 percent operating rates are always present when we have plants that are down. So that's something that is difficult to, to really follow. Natural gas, uh, and that goes with the ethylene and ethane. Um, ethane is a byproduct of natural gas. So I'll go through a little cost model as we get through here, but ethane is made from uh, natural gas. So some uncertainties, you know, why do we have the lowest cost and, uh, and why will the suppliers continue to maintain record margins? Now, I think their margins are gonna get compressed, but they're still record margins, you know, going from 40 cents to 30 cents a pound when 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was two or three cents a pound. Very healthy. And try to talk about what's going on, what, what our outlook is going forward. Exports have been the number one driver for polyethylene pricing over the last 15 years. The ability to export product at any time you want. That's been significant over the last few years, over the last 15 years, and it's a big impact on moving inventories very quickly to get them out of the North American hands and ship them somewhere else to maintain uh, a good level of su supply. So here in 2013 are the top importers into China. 
Iran is, uh, Iran is limited on who they can trade with, so, it's, so they're selling everything they can to China, because China will buy from Iran. Um, those are the top. In 2008, we were number three. We don't even go to China anymore. It's limited products that's going there. That's your company that has a plant there that buys product A that's getting shipped over there. It's not a trader transaction business anymore to China. We don't participate in the Chinese market. And China imports 40% of their resin, and they don't, they don't play with us. So what's happened is, over the last three or four years, there's been a shift of, of the US market going to Asia to the US market going to Latin America. So exports to Asia in uh, 2012 were 25% of, uh, of the export volume. Today, they're 9%. And they're probably going to be lower than that shortly. Exports to Latin America, where 40% of the exported product is now over 61%. So we've got a new, a new very good customer down south. And what's happened is, because of our cost advantage, all we had to do was sell underneath the delivered price from the oil-based resin market out of Southeast Asia. So the Latin American market could not go to Asia anymore. They came to us because we were selling just below their price. And we were able to now move their prices up a little bit so we have a, a good customer consuming a lot of resins, and the prices are getting better. And they're much better than what we had to do to Asia. So what's, what's happened this year, and this is all leading up until this, all this information is, is history, but you need to know the history before we get to what's going to happen in the next few months. In, in September, Robin had a trader call her who sells resin to Latin America and asked her if RTI could buy butene film resins for her. We don't buy resins. We can't do that. She couldn't get any. That trader couldn't get any. The butene price in Latin America was at or above the North American price in, uh, in, in the butene North American price. So all of a sudden, we're exporting at a price that's as good as our price. I mean, that's a home run. Everything finally worked out. We got right to that level. We hit, we hit the number. We got up there. Latin America could not buy from anywhere else but us because we, we sold underneath the oil price, just underneath the oil price. So, Selling a car to, to uh, Houston is a better deal than selling it to Chicago. You get that thing turned around twice, you're making 40 cents a pound on a car that you can sell two times in 60 days versus a car that sits in your plant for 60 days. So even if it's a few cents under, it's a better deal. This is, this is a home run for the suppliers. So here's a, here's a little picture of what's happening here. 61% is going to Mexico and South, um, 9%. 4% to China, 9% total to the Pacific Rim. And again, that's, that's limited product, that's specialty products. It's not the commodity product. It's a limited product that's heading over there. And that'll probably stay steady for, for a long time. The uh, linear low resins and high density resins are the two biggest exported resins. Low density is uh, it's, it's a steady business. Low density is sort of a, a dying global resin. There's no real no, new products that come up for, for a low density. There's better resins to be out there. So I want to go over a cost model in Asia. Just so, and, and this is, I think, going forward with the oil price changes, this is very key to understand this and help understand, to know where you're at. So this is a standard formula. Naphtha, which is a byproduct of oil, plus 250 to convert naphtha into ethylene. So it's roughly about 43 cents a pound to make a pound of ethylene from uh, naphtha, which comes from oil. So you've got 43 cents, a conversion into a pellet, uh, and put into a bag, and shipped to a, a plant in Asia is roughly 56 cents a pound. Um, that's probably an eight cent conversion, two cents into a bag. So 56 cents a pound for naphtha, which is priced today just around $700, a little less in Europe, a little more in, uh, in Japan. So 56 cents a pound is the delivered cost. It's not the sale price, that's the delivered cost. So that's the new bottom. In, at $90, it, was, it cost 70 cents to make a pellet. So we're at a, we're 15, 16, 
15, 15 cents higher than it was uh, a month ago. Uh, I'm sorry, lower than it was a month ago. So Latin America, $90 oil is a 75 cent pellet delivered to a door. That's, that's without margin. The freight to Latin America is four cents on water, three cents uh, on ground, roughly. So the cost model in the US is ethane, which is a byproduct of natural gas, times 0.43. That's a, a formula that is accepted by any producer out there. You can sit in front of them and they'll tell you and they'll, they'll agree with that. Trades are made using that formula. So you're looking at about 11 cents at 25 cents uh, a gallon. And, and right now, na uh, ethane trade today, I think, is at 21. So it's moving down. Ethane, trade, ethane will track with natural gas pretty much, you know, not dollar for dollar, but it tracks with natural gas. So your cost to convert in the States or North America is 12 cents conversion. Let's call it three to five cents freight. You're, you're under 30 cents for a pellet here. And, and resin pricing today is significantly higher than that. So Middle East costs are very similar to this. So feedstocks, North American feedstocks have nothing to do with the cost of resin. It's good to know what they are, but it doesn't matter. You, when you've got 11 cents ethylene out there, uh, it doesn't matter, you, know, you, you don't have to pay that close attention to it. If there was some significant uh, increases in natural gas due to some big problem, that's when you start paying attention. But until that day, I think we're just good to know the numbers. Um, one of the things, and I asked this morning about th this question, is this, the spot ethylene market is a number that's thrown around out there. You'll have suppliers say, spot ethylene's this. I have to buy spot ethylene at that. What spot the spot ethylene market is, if you're running 10 million pounds a month and, you, and you're integrated, you're getting 10 million pounds of ethylene from within your own organization. If you have an ethylene outage and you can only get 8 million pounds, you've got to go out and buy that 2 million pounds. So 20% of your resin is being made with 70 cent resin, or 70 cent cost. The other 80% or more is being made with a, you know, a, a 11, cent, a 11 cent cost. It's, if you do the cost averaging, it's less, than, it's a few pennies, if, that, if even that much. So here's, this is the, forecast from September 1st. We had, the, the bottom line is the cash cost to make ethylene, that's the change in the cash cost. So the cash costs have fluctuated between 10 and 12 cents. We had a cold little winter snap there last year, we all recall that, and, and it's back down. So we're 10 to 12 cents the cost to make ethylene, no big deal. Polyethylene prices, 24 cents higher. Uh, in, on September 1st, I had this thing going up because I see supply, supply being tight, oil staying above $90, resident manufacturers saying, I, if I can get another increase, I'm going to go for it. Possibly a disruption. Next year was going flat to up. We've, that, this oil thing changed the whole thing. So just to run through some real feedstocks, these are projections that were made at the end of August. Um, we have ethane prices staying flat, so ethane shouldn't affect polyethylene. We have, spot, we have the ethylene prices coming down. This is a very tight market, uh, but there was a, this is a disruption-driven spike. These people are coming back on. They will be back on. There's new capacity um, that's old capacity that was out for a year that's coming back on. Um, three or four major outages. They're all coming back. This will only get, ethylene prices will, will, get, will get better. Um, just some restart dates. These are some ethylene crackers that are out that were, are coming back. So you've got CP Chem coming back next year. Williams is coming back. Uh, we've got a couple that were coming back in, in the month of October. So ethylene's going to be healthy. So natural gas pricing, they're projecting pretty much flat pricing, maybe a little spike up in, in 2016, but you know, the three to four dollar range. No real concerns. Oil. They missed this one already. This is a $90 projection the EIA did, um, you know, going out through the next three years. They saw a firm, stable oil. So does, does the $80 replace this? I mean, if we have time to tell here. It's very new. We know that. But, you know, it's, you, we all read different things. 
So this is my forecast September 4th in, in September. I gave this in front of a group in Canada, and the next day oil fell $10. So it was based on a predictable supplier action. I'm going to raise the price. That's the, that's the predictable supplier action. There's no way they were going to say they're going to lower the price next year. The second one, there's going to be an outage. Uh, and oil prices stay the same, and the economy's good. They keep the three cents. There's another four to six cent increase next year. Uh, ethylene, you know, disruptions continue. Oil stays at 90, and there's not a global recession. Boom, done. <laughs> Throw it out. <laughs> I'll never be welcome back in Canada. People were taking pictures of my forecast on their iPhones. I'm like, you know, so luckily, we all know, I don't think anyone predicted oil falling in this room. If they did, I'd like to get in touch with you later. Well, Kyle did. So oil is, now, oil, is, oil is and has been the driver. And we'll get to my slide in a few, month, a few, week, a few weeks, a few months. Um, oil creates that floor because you're going to price resin off of the highest price feedstock, and that's naphtha. So oil, oil is going to start to drive. Naphtha and oil track with each other. There is not a one-to-one -one formula. So oil goes up or down. You can't track it. Uh, there's no formula to track it, but they move up and down together. Um, Naphtha is a byproduct of oil, so if somebody chooses to make that, so that could get tight or it could go long, depending on the, the producer making that. Um, I, one of the things I think is going to be interesting is that China importing 40% of their resin, they do have some capacities coming on, but they are a buyer of resin, and the, and the Southeast Asian market has gotten very competitive. There's a lot of activity in Thailand. There's, there's 3,000 resin processors in Vietnam now exporting all of that. So they're, they're going to start competing for, for, uh, for resins from other regions. And that's going to keep that price, that'll help keep that price a little firm as well. And I'm talking firm prices, I'm not talking September prices, I'm talking a new level. I don't know what that, we don't know where that level is, but it'll, it'll get there and it'll get there soon. So some of the market dynamics in the North American market is that that incremental pound, the extra resin available, is what influenced the pricing. So this last two years, resin markets have been tight. Supplier A has not walked into supplier B's customer and said, I got extra resin. What will you do for me? That's just not happening. Supplier A is saying, how much do you need? And I'll try to get it all for you. So that, that's a change that if that happens, that will influence our marketing very much. And that could, that could be happening if suppliers decide to do something incorrect here. <laughs> Secondary market. Um, there hasn't been secondary market product available. You can't go out and buy, no one's offering you 10 extra cars. They'll try to get you a car. That could change as well. Um, so you need some competitive activity to create a need for market share and then create some type of pricing activity. Without competitive activity, there's no reason to lower your price. Um, this last one here is your problem. Um, You've developed products because your customers have put unreasonable, re have made unreasonable requests. You've developed a product for that, and now you can't get out of that box. So it's very difficult to make a change. The, the garbage bag that was, has been developed over years, you know, all I needed to do is get from my kitchen to my garbage bag. Now I can stick you know, a leaf, leaf's in and everything else. I don't need that. But Walmart wants it. The consumer wants it. Now the guy who's making a butene trash bag out of garbage has to make some, has to buy hexene or something special or put something to blend in there. Now he's stuck in a box. So that's a challenge going forward. Going, stepping into the 2018 market, this is what you want to change. You want to be able to be very, very flexible. You want to have enough different opportunities so when, so when the supplier comes to you with that extra 15 billion pounds that are coming on, you want to be able to say, I can take it because I can change up three different things. If they're making one product and you can't run it, it's, it doesn't matter how much extra product is out there. So the global cost to make resin. This is getting to the fun stuff finally. So you had on the top line here a delivered bag from Southeast Asia, a delivered pellet to Southeast Asia up until September was 82 cents. Our delivered bag, our delivered pellet was 80 cents. We were a cost advantage going into, into, South, into Latin America um, versus Southeast Asia versus $100, $90 oil, $900 to 1,000 naphtha per metric tons. 
this, this is how quickly this changed from 9.15 to 10.15, you're down to now it's, uh, it costs 70 cents to deliver a pellet into Asia and it costs, now that's, no mar that's, that's minimal margins. That's not a selling price, that's a delivered price. And it costs, um, costs us 80, 84 cents. It's a 14 cent delta there. You're not gonna buy 14 cents a pound more. Nobody's that good. So that's a challenge. Now, the Latin American price is not 70 cents right now. The Latin American price is about, uh, I think it probably equal to about 59, 69. That's what the selling price is, 69. So there's margin there for the, the Asian supplier. So the resin availability is gonna continue to drive prices. If we have resin, the prices are gonna fall. If we don't have resin, prices are gonna stay at that new firm level. Um, exports or imports, uh, the imported products, and I mean by that is a finished product, a, a garbage bag, a, a shampoo bottle, five gallon bucket filled with paint or, uh, or chemicals. If, if we don't make a change in our pricing, um, there's going to be a significant amount of imported products that will displace, um, that will displace residents used here. Uh, quick story, I think I've shared this with some of you guys already. Got a customer, 10 million pounds, half their business is can liners. Um, they were going to hire four new employees and start making more can liners. They're, they are now getting asked to uh, uh, sell their bags at 10 cents less than they can make them for. So instead of hiring four new employees, he's gonna stop running a line and probably bring those bags in from Southeast Asia. And they will deliver to his customer a 10 cents a pound less than he can make them for. If that continues, that's gonna hurt, that's gonna be a quick impact here. So the Southeast Asian, what the challenge is, is they're gonna be able to make resin below 60 cents a pound and even though we can make resin lower than that, we're not selling it lower than that. And that's, that's our problem. We have to get that thing adjusted. So you got two, two situations here. If, the, if we stay at $80 oil, you've got a, a proactive supplier or a reactive supplier. And you can make big arguments on both sides of this. The proactive supplier starts taking your price right down. Even though there's no inventory out there, no extra inventory, there's no competitive situations, all those fundamentals, they have to just walk it down because we have to get globally competitive. Or they wait until inventories grow, the export market stops, supply gets to uh, outpaces demand, and sales are lost to Asian manufacturing. That may never come back. Proactive, uh, you know, I'm getting, a, uh, I'm getting a bonus this year, and uh, I've already set my sales dollars out. I'm personally going to take in an extra five grand if prices stay high for the rest of the year make me take the price down. I don't know, we, I don't know how this is gonna happen. Um, reactive is what they've always done. They waited too long and the markets go crazy and it's all too bad. They have a very good opportunity to make a change. So this is the picture that I wanted to show and just talk about. The, the bottom lines here, this is the cost, the cost to make uh, pellets out of naphtha. So from 2012, ever since the oil's been at 90, we've had, we've had uh, two years, three years of steady, and here we are. And this is why we were able to take our prices all the way up here, because there was a, high, there was a, there was a floor that was created. All we were doing was getting there closer and closer and closer. Easy. Anything that you didn't want went to Latin America at, at almost at your price. Their prices crept up just with our prices. It, the party's over now. Nap this down here. We can't stay up there. If you look at the, the lines above it, that's the cost to make a plastic bag. We were gaining market share versus in, in the US, in North America, versus the Asian bags coming in. People started to make t-shirt bags. There are more can liners being made. We were gaining market share. You could quote on something outside this country and actually get the business. That's all, over, that's all done too. In order for us to get this right, to be able to compete again, to, to have that guy who runs 10 million pounds hire those four people, we got to get our prices down here in that 65, the, the, the 67 range, 65 cent range. We're 14 to 15 cents over that now. I don't know how we get that. I could tell you that in the last two years or the last year, 
since September of 13 till today, there's been 12 cents of price increases that had, it was just because you could. And everybody here raised their hand when I asked them if you could get more money, would you? Well, they all, that's what they did. So they, 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 we need to get a, a way to get that price down. It's gonna get sloppy if it doesn't get there. So it's a supplier's choice. You don't export, supplies improve, competition, market share returns, you're gonna have to lower the price. That's, that's the, the wait and see thing. Um, or if the suppliers meet the export, it could be demand destruction. So the export price, um, the export price in August for butene was 77 cents. In September, it was 77 cents. The Korean market came in and is selling at what is the equivalent to about a 69, 70 cent rail car. This week, Three suppliers were, uh, traders went to three suppliers. One says, I'll give you down three cents. One says, I'll give you down two cents. No, thank you, keep your export resin. The other one, I'll give you the seven cents. So two things, they have resin. If they didn't have resin, they wouldn't have sold that guy at 70 cents. The other thing is, those other two are gonna have to either reply, they're gonna have to respond to that, or maybe they don't have resin. But the, the, if they, if they sell at that 70 cents, it could keep your prices where they are. But as soon as that, th th that can't be sustained with imported products coming in, it'll just destroy everything. They've done it in other, you know, other industries have experienced it. So do we get the supply or they, you know, does the, the demand keep up? So does anyone have any questions? Well, well, you know, you could go back, you go back 10 years ago and you had um, 12 suppliers. 15 years ago, you had 12 suppliers. 10 years ago, you had eight. Let me that. I'll just turn this off. I can talk. Um, so, of those, of those eight suppliers, you, you, now you had Exxon Mobil, you had Chevron Phillips, you had Dow Carbide, um, Lyondell Bissell. Now you got four. You have Westlake, you have Total, you have Formosa, um, Ineos. Those last four I just mentioned, they can't do anything because they don't make every resin. They, Total doesn't make any low density. Um, you know, Ineos doesn't do low densities, Westlake doesn't do high density, but those other four, they, got, they do everything. So they can influence the market up and down. Now, Chevron Phillips doesn't have any resin, so they, and they've been very responsible, but, but not a leader. And you've had the competition at the top has really been, um, I, I think it's Nova and um, Dow and um, ExxonMobil. Dow, can't stop sending out price increase letters and nobody pays attention to them anymore. Um, Exxon ignored two price increase letters uh, in, in last spring and the uh, fall and, and, and the price increases didn't go through. Exxon led the one in, uh, or Exxon came out in August. I think Exxon, unfortunately, you've got, of those four, you've turned this market into a one, a one supplier guy. Now, you've, someone's gotta make that call going into you know, who, who determines this price in November and December of whether or not it's gonna go down or not. You had Nova Chemical, Nova was very hesitant to raise that pricing, that price. I think they were pushed into raising the price in August. They may be the first ones to do that. If they do that, you're gonna to have to have Exxon maybe support that. It's gonna come down. I think everyone recognizes that. It's just how they do this thing. But ex watching what Exxon does, it'll be very important. Now, Exxon did not lower the, the ex the, were one of the suppliers that did not meet the 70 cent export. So, um, you know, maybe they don't have enough resin yet. But if, so, if, the, if there's a, a resin price god, that may be, they may be the ones, unfortunately. Yeah, Andy? You know, there's product, yeah, there's product that goes out there. Um, I know Dow does their high density out of there, uh, from Dow to Dow. Um, but 
the traders that we're talking to are typically out of Texas. I don't know if that's, I mean, that's, where, the, that's where the supply base started years ago. So. All right. Um, okay, Sam loves it when I say this. It doesn't matter. It's all the oil. I'm an oil guy. That oil price is going to is going to set that ceiling. So we have no capacity coming on in Mexico next year. Um, we have no capacity. Com there's isn't uh, Brazcam got like five. Five coming on 2015. Right. Um, I, you know, it's. Uh, I think you and I did this math once. Um, there's how much goes to there's eight billion pounds a year goes to uh, goes to export out of a forty billion pound market and then you've got uh, say uh, sixty per, sixty percent of that eight billion is maybe call it five five billion going to Latin America and that was a five hundred million pound I think they're one point two okay so so yeah you're gonna have you're gonna have that uh, can they find another home they they can because we can sell it cheaper I don't know if that'll have an impact. The other thing too is um, the Latin American, I'm not taking any, I don't take this into account, but I, you, you really should. Latin American economies are, are the ones that are growing the fastest in the world right now. So is there demand strong enough? Probably. Uh. Alrighty. Any others? Thank you, Mike.